welcome to the Wallace Collection, Jessie. Um, and we're in this amazing room. I don't know what it's called, but it's full of Marie Antoinette's furniture. And I nearly it's got amazing. into trouble the minute I got here <laughs> by putting your book on a on a one of these fabulous tables that's not allowed to have anything Very on it. Naughty. So I nearly got us thrown out before we started. <laughs> Everybody who's watching will know you from your mega enormous stratospheric <laughs> bestseller, the miniaturist. Um, so. Before we, we're here to talk about The Muse, which is your second novel, but the first yeah. novel, your first novel, The Miniaturist, we, I'm going to take you back to that crazy time mm -hmm. first, which may not be a crazy time you want to go back to, but we, <laughs> so we won't stay there too long. Okay. Um, and I'm going to apologise now for the constant tapping on my phone, because I did all yeah. my notes on my phone and it keeps turning That's itself fine. off. Um, so The Miniaturist sold, it was a 10-way auction, was it? 11. 11. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Come on, Sam. Right, so it was an 11-way <laughs> auction. It's uh, published in 36 languages, yeah. sold over a million copies. Is that in the UK alone or is that...? No, that's worldwide. That's worldwide. Yeah. Oh, slacking. I know. Come on. Come on, Jess. Crack on. Yeah, so I'm sure you can do better than that. And it spent three months in the Sunday Times bestseller list. So um, looking back, was that two years ago? That was, yeah, that was the first of the summer of 2014 and then the Christmas of 2014, yeah. So, in a weird way, it feels much, much longer ago than that, and that's... Yeah, it's the strange thing of feeling incredibly recent, like the paperback of The Miniaturist only actually came out last year, which is crazy to me to think that The Muse is coming out this year, but also, yeah, it feels like quite a while ago. A lot has happened since then. Yeah, an awful lot. If someone, mm. we do this uh, thing on the pool called The Pool Reads, which is just because we felt like we were all reading so many books that weren't getting air time. Mm. Um, it's just literally, what are you reading this week? And I go around the office. And about four weeks ago, uh, someone said, oh, I'm reading The Miniaturist. I was like, <laughs> what? What do you mean you're reading The Miniaturist? But I think it's important, if you're a big book reader, it's, I guess it's important to remember that filter down process so oh yeah just because i read a book before it was out yeah yeah yeah. doesn't mean that you know no and some people, people just read one book a year you know or two yeah, books a like year like my dad on holiday yeah so, as opposed to two a week yeah exactly which is not normal no by any stretch of the imagination <laughs> um do you feel like now does it feel like a bit of a weird dream or it does sometimes feel elements of it do feel very unreal um i think it's partly because i was trying to differentiate between me as the writer and then the book itself and the phenomenon of the book and where I was to, to you know supposed to position myself um, but so much of it was just so you know unexpected and um, over the top and unusual that it was quite hard to assimilate so yeah it remains quite unreal. When you've written like one of those books mm. that actually be kind of becomes popular culture almost which I would say that does apply to the miniaturist um, the, not only the book and the characters, but also you do become kind of public property in a way. Yeah. How did that feel? Uh, <laughs> it wasn't the most comfortable feeling. I mean, actually, do you know what? At the, at the time it was all happening, it was absolutely fine. I was just on the sort of treadmill of talking about the book. I was incredibly grateful that anyone wanted to talk to me about my book. It was also new and exciting and incredible, but it wasn't until about, I don't know, about seven or eight months after publication that it really hit me that that's not normal you know, mm. this kind of prodding and probing and, you know, the personality of the author, the psychology of the author, the story of the author, you know, where, how much do you balance that with actually the creative work and the, and the, the fiction? Mm. And um, I found that quite challenging at times, but only, you know, afterwards, only after the event. And you're an actor, aren't you? So to be yourself mm. on stage as opposed to be acting. Yeah. Kind of weird? It is weird. It is weird and you feel less protected. Definitely. Um, and also you're on your own. When I was in a company of actors, it was a team effort and it was fun and we'd dis dissect it all in the pub after. But, you know, writing is incredibly solitary and, um, and then it becomes incredibly public and social because you're in a gang of, you know, selling the book and doing events and stuff. But um, I guess I've just accepted that, you know, we have many versions of ourselves and there's no true authentic version. And, you know, it's just fine to be the girl I am or the woman I am talking about my book as much as I am the private person. There's not great difference between them, but you get yeah. better at understanding what it all means. And it's kind of a weird contradiction, isn't it, what's expected of authors, to be able to sit in a room yeah, for months on mad. end on your, on your own, talking to no one, in, living in your head. <laughs> talking to the people in your head. And then to be able to perform yeah. and maybe have to perform for, in your case, six months. Yeah, longer. Possibly more. Longer. Yeah, no, and I think it is weird because it's sort of, I think for many authors or writers, it's completely anathema to their 
comfort and their being and and I don't mind it actually I'm quite gregarious I actually hate <laughs> I hate being on my own for no, me too. I hate periods the other of time bit, yeah. yeah it's really tough the and actual writing. yeah yeah the writing bit's a bit hard um you have to you have to monitor yourself I think and it can be tough being alone all that time I mean, I'm, I'm not going to dwell on it, but at the beginning of the year, you wrote an, that absolutely amazing oh, essay yeah. on your blog um, about creativity and anxiety, mm. which was about the experience of, of sudden success yeah. and how, how that was. Um, what was it that made you, what made you do that? Yeah, 9,000 words. Of <laughs> I know, it's soul I printed vomit. it out, 11 pages. Oh, my God. On, in 12 point. You know, it took me a really long time to write that. That took me about six or seven months and I kept trying to write it I knew I had to write something but I couldn't because I was still in the sort of gloom and the mist and the fog and the depression and it was really hard and actually classically it was only after it was kind of um, had diminished that I could analyze it and look at it I felt that I, I wanted to to sort of be public about it partly because I don't think there should be so much stigma around anxiety mm. and depression and the fluctuating mental health states we all will experience in our lives um, but also, I just was feeling like I was cracking up under the public and the private truths. Mm. And I needed to kind of close that gap a bit more. And I knew, you know, I was going forward, going to be talking about the muse in my new book and being under scrutiny and talking at length. And I needed, I just needed to sort of clear the air. Um, and I wanted to do it earlier rather than around now. So yeah. it didn't look like a kind of another a publicity stunt, exactly so like, another yeah. thing of using me and my life and my heart and my soul to sell a book. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to talk about it as a separate thing. You made a really interesting point, I thought, in, in well, many very interesting points. But the one thing that really stood out for me and stood out for me again today when I was reading it this morning is uh, about change and about mm. how people, for the for the nicest possible reasons, but the people around you, the people who know you best, don't want you to change, and they put a lot mm. of pressure on you mm. not to change, when actually if you, you're dealing with an enormous out-of-the-blue event, mm. as the success of the miniaturist probably was, change isn't kind of necessary. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And I think it's, it was quite accelerated, <laughs> it was quite mm. rapid, and um, I just couldn't catch up with it. But yeah, there was this fear and this guilt that I knew that you know, I was having to meet different responsibilities and different adventures and different challenges and that if I didn't adapt or sort of expand and, you know, accept that there were going to be times that I wasn't going to be able to do X, Y or Z and I had to do A, B and Z or whatever. And yeah, you feel like you have a kind of duty to your friends and family to be the same person. But of course, this kind of thing was utterly transformative to me. And I think at heart, you know, I still am the same, but it's just the horizons have expanded. And, you know, um, another point you made is about your aim had been, I want to write, I want to act, yeah. I want to write, I'd love to have a book published. Mm. Um, and so like when you, you set a goal and you've got a plan and you can kind of work towards it in an organised or a disorganised way. Yeah. Um, having met that goal, how did you get yourself to writing The mm. Muse? It's really interesting. I was actually reading an article about how human beings have such high dopamine levels when they're aiming for something, when they're striving, because it's literally the self-defining thing. And then you get it, and you literally don't know what to do with yourself. And that's exactly what happened to me. It was this, you know, I describe it as the exhaustion of arrival. You get your goal, you get your dream, and suddenly, you know, you're on the cliff edge and you're just free-falling. That's hard. Um, and I think... Although I wouldn't change anything, you know, I'm really happy that everything has yeah. happened and it's the best thing that's ever happened to me. But I think I just had to remember what was most important to me and why I did it in the first place. Because it can be easy to get your head turned. And the most important thing for me is, is writing and making work that I'm proud of and that I hope, believe that readers would want to enjoy themselves. So I kind of tried to keep that as my anchor, work, which sounds a bit sort of holier than thou and a bit prim. But maybe I am a bit prim. I <laughs> but I just had to, like, you know, be a little puritanical about it all, which was a shame. But you can't, enjoy, it's impossible to enjoy so much bounty all in one go. It's kind of bite sized chunks, it's fine. But it all kind of came in a big ton. <laughs> yeah, it's easy to be wise after the event as well, isn't it? Oh, say, yeah. Oh, I wish I'd enjoyed that more. I it's know. It's like the Nora Ephron thing, isn't it? I wish I'd worn a bikini the whole year. I know. Oh, well, the <laughs> yeah. year I was 26. It's like, yeah, but you yeah, didn't, yeah, yeah. did no, you? No, you know, and that, I think. no. 
Did you have um, social media being the beast it is? Mm. It went, that essay went viral, and I did see an amazing response to it. But did you also get people going, oh, my diamond shoes are too tight? Uh, do you know what? I didn't. And that's what I was quite nervous about, because obviously I didn't want it to look like I was complaining. And it is quite rare to have someone go public about the flip side of success. But I think it's actually safer to do that. It's more sane um, rather than to sort of perform the dream. Um, but actually people were incredibly generous to me and other writers, you know, private messages, but also emails to me from people who suffer anxiety, psychotherapists, like emailing me saying, this is, can I use this to kind of describe mm. anxiety? And, you know, it's kind of hit the nail on the head. So maybe privately people like rolling their eyes at me publicly. No, <laughs> so I'm in, I'm in blissful ignorance. Yeah, you but, didn't um, have to see it. No, so no. But, you know, whatever, like, I don't, I don't really care. Uh, that's another thing. I've just grown a little tougher. If they don't like it, whatever. Like, I don't care. Yeah, <laughs> I don't care anymore. Difference. Yeah. Is that, do you think, would you say that's been a product of the miniaturist experience? What, not, a not. Skin, oh, maybe. yeah, def definitely. I think, I mean, I'm still pretty permeable, I'd say. But I, you know, you have to just pick and choose what's going to get under your skin, I think. And um, not waste your day worrying. You know, I, t I did feel tremendously guilty because of the success and, you know, I know, you know, I could do better and I want to do the best work I can. And so, you know, obviously barbed comments hurt, but maybe less and less these days. Who knows? Who cares? Maybe. Who cares? But, it, yeah. you know, we're still all vulnerable people, but, yeah. you know, I can't, I can't let it bother me. It doesn't m affect my work. So did you, when it came to, you kind of came out of that, kind of miniaturist frenzy and then you had to write yeah I guess you had a two book deal yeah, yeah yeah and then you had to write another book yeah just bash another one out yeah just whilst you're on the road <laughs> obviously you can write on a plane so you're fine yeah yeah no, just write no a few chapters deal. yeah flying yeah. to New York darling did you have um def difficult second novel syndrome um yeah <laughs> I did I mean the cliche is there because it's true I I thankfully had a sort of vague structure or a vague idea when I actually met Picador about the miniaturist and they asked me, you know, you, you know, have you got any other ideas, please? <laughs> yeah. Are you just a yes. one-hit wonder? Um, Standing over you with a stick. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but it really did mutate. The book mutated through 2015, mm. I think, actually, in response to what had happened to me. Um, but, yeah, no, I found it. It wasn't so much that I didn't think I could write. I kind of, I think, in some secret part of my heart, knew I could do that, but it was actually the mental energy required to engage mm. both with myself who was you know I was struggling uh, with esteem and other issues um, but also finding the physical strength to write a book I know you sit still but you use a hell of a lot of energy mm. as you know to write a hundred thousand word novel so it was more just a sort of I was just it was like a catatonic kind of energy that I was like trying to fight against um, and I I, I was struggling. I, I think I sent about, I sent all the Spanish section because it's divided into two sections, the book Spanish and London, Spain and London. And I sent it to my agent and that was actually good because it sort of broke open, kind of broke the spell that I was trapped in. And as soon as we started having a conversation, I knew what I did and didn't like about it. I'm very collaborative in that respect. So that helped me. But yeah, I found it challenging. Yeah, it was very hard at times. So tell us a bit, like you said about the Spanish and London section, tell us a bit about the story of the news. So there are two time periods. Uh, it's pre-Civil War in Spain, so January 36, and London in 1967. And it sort of, it tells the story of these two women in these two time periods. Olive Schloss, who's a young, aspiring painter, secretly painting. Her father's an art dealer, he doesn't know she paints. And Adele Bastian, who's from Trinidad, lived in London for five years, come to try and make it as a writer and finds herself up against all kinds of um, adversities. And it's about this long lost masterpiece called Rafina and the Lion, which is a painting that links these two girls together. And it's a book about identity, self-creation, friendship, art, first love, and, uh, and, and yeah, female, female, I don't know, female bonds as well. I think um, it really struck me when I read The Miniaturist that um, uh, the, the character was really a 
I really, I really hate strong female characters. I know, isn't really it? Really the worst. You never say ever. strong male character, no. would you? No. But I, I had I this yesterday. Actually, a yeah. kind of a, <laughs> a quiet, firm feminism ran through Nella yeah. in the miniaturist, and that is really apparent. I would say, actually, in all the female characters in, in the Muse, mm. but particularly in Adele, yeah, um, and not so quiet, but very firm in Olive. Mm. Mm. Um, is that intentional, or is that just you? I think it's just me. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think, um, yeah, it's an interesting one, this whole idea of sort of strong female. Like, for me, most, nearly all women are, by default, strong. Uh, or, 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 you know, this quality is always... I know it's a kind of catch-all adjective, but I think, um, for me, it's just natural that these women and girls are going to be striving and um, forward-thinking and brave and confrontational and argumentative and challenging. Um, as an author, as a writer, it's more exciting to write characters like that rather than I'm passive. Reader. And yeah. as a reader, of course. So, um, but no, it's never, it's never deliberate. It's just how they come out. <laughs> yeah. Um, and not 100% likeable, actually. Which no. Is a good thing as far no, as I'm concerned. No, exactly. But. And that's important to me too, because I think, you know, we're always held up to be we have to be likeable, we have to make people like us, we have to be approved of. I mean, I suffer from that massively, you know, and always have. Um, and so it's, it's fun to write people who are, you know, put your nose out of joint or just, you know, don't act how you think they're going to act. And I do think that when it's a woman doing it, it seems completely much, well, so much more inflammatory. If a woman takes up space, if a woman says, well, I'm not doing that, if a woman, you know, it's like... Yeah, or a woman behaves badly. Yeah. And whatever badly is. Yeah, exactly. It's, yeah, so it's, it's fun to write and it, those kind of characters. And it's fascinating for me as a writer to, f to, to get feedback from readers at how much they identify and how much they love them. Why is that? Yeah. You know, I think it's because there aren't enough of them. There aren't enough of them and it's validation as well, I yeah. think. Um, in um, it's one of the things that was really interesting to me is that you know Olive is uh, it's 36 and she is you know, she wants she's a, a painter but no one knows that she paints and you know very much trying to find her way and find a way to get her art out there in mm. a um, in a very much man's world. Mm. 30 years later, Adele is doing the same thing but she has additional disadvantages. Um, and do you, obviously things have changed, but do you think that's that still happens now? Um, yeah, I think it does still happen now. I think it's probably more insidious. I mean, sometimes it's completely overt. I think we still live in a racist, <laughs> sexist world. But I think it's so much more striated now. And I think that, you know, you have different elements of privilege that will elevate you above somebody else, but then you might suffer some other kind of discrimination. Um, Personally, I've, I've, I've viewed myself as quite a privileged person, my upbringing, my, my family, my health, where I was born, my, the colour of my skin. Um, and I've never actually felt being a woman has ever held me back. I've been incredibly lucky in that respect. I get patronised every now and then, but that's the worst I get. Other people suffer so much more, and I think it still continues. You know, it's still going on. And, you know, people are dying because of their sexuality. Women are being told that they can't have abortions. You know, it's just, you sometimes think, am I living... Am I living in 1686 Amsterdam? <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think, of course it carries on. Of course it carries on. Adele is, um, has, is Trinidadian yeah. and has come to London um, five years earlier. Mm -hmm. Did you, um, do you think twice about writing a woman of colour? Uh, well... This is to give you practice for when a difficult person asks you yeah, this yeah, question. Yeah, 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 no, I'm, I'm getting, I'm, I know it's coming. Um, yes, I did. I did in the sense that I thought, I mean, it was a kind of like moral argument in my head. Do I have a right in a way? Is this cultural appropriation? But I also thought, well, she's part of London in the 1960s. It's an absolutely massive part of this city and this country's history now. But not just in the 20th century, in the 19th, 18th, 17th century. That's a long line that goes back, mm -hmm. right back to slavery, right back to colonialism. And I think Britain has kind of dealt with that slightly with India, but maybe less so with the West Indian ex-colonies. And I think the gen of it started for me with the miniaturist and the sugar trade and like my awareness growing. But also, I knew that Adele 
the prism that Adele views the world is, also, is her Trinidadian heritage, but it's also that she's a woman too. So I was trying to make sure she had, uh, you know, love adventures and she had ambitions and she, it wasn't just about that she was a black woman because for her it wasn't that either. You know, she came from a very hierarchical society dictated by Englishness and whiteness and then she comes mm. to London she's just black. It's just this blanket adjective. And I found that really fascinating. The bit about sending her right, your, her, having to send your writing yeah. to London for yeah. it to be broadcast back at you by the yeah. World Service yeah. to be legitimised. Yeah, it's yeah, really yeah. Fascinating. So I guess from a historical viewpoint, I found it very interesting. From a more creative viewpoint, I, I, I did view it as a challenge, but I also didn't want to kind of panic about it. And and yeah, I just I just thought well. I think Adele, Adele is Adele, Adele is from Trinidad, you know, and it was just how it, it was quite organic. But I did, you know, I was nervous about when I used the girls when she talks to her best friend Cynthia and they're talking in p Patois. Yeah. I had a contact at the University of the West Indies in Trini, who is probably about the age Adele would be now, and she went through it all um, and helped me. I was, was going to ask you yeah. that. Was... Yeah, because yeah, I'm clearly not, <laughs> yeah. clearly not from Trinidad. Um, so... But yeah, I mean, it would just be interesting. It'd just be interesting to see how it's received. Um, yeah, because I'm obviously white and I've written that. But, you know, I think another argument people will say, well, if a writer can't inhabit mm. another... But I, I think that's a little basic. I think there are, there are fine-tuned things at play. Yeah, I and mean, she is a lead. And as you say, there are two main female leads, but really there are four main female characters. Yeah. Um, Marjorie Quick is really <laughs> fascinating <laughs> character to me. Yeah. Is she based on anyone you know? <laughs> She's kind of based on my fantasy self that I yeah. want to be when I'm I like... Know, I'd love to be her when I grow up. <laughs> she's <yeah>. great. <laughs> I love her because she's so unapologetic. She's so stylish. Um, she's strangely mysterious, incredibly generous, but yet kind of, you know, quite waspish at times. Um, she, she's just your... Because Adele's a writer and, and she's imaginative, just meeting someone like that would just be such a massive challenge and such an enigma. And yeah, she was just a great, fun character to write. And just calling her Marjorie Quick, I don't even know where that came from. No, it's like... <laughs> it just came to me one day. I was like, yeah, she's going to be called Quick. Um, yeah, she, she's a kind of idealised future self for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a research-heavy book, and so is the miniaturist. Do you mm. enjoy that aspect? I love it, yeah. I find it really helpful because, it's, you know, you might read a history book and, you know, you'll get one sentence that's really useful about, I don't know, how they made croissants or something or, you know, it's just super useful, that kind of um, research, that base. But I always want to read it and then not discard it but just kind of bury it and make sure that I'm, you know, story is king and, 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 and creating a fictional, you know, world is more important than, I don't want to say than getting the facts right, but I think as long as your facts are right, you can fly. There's a real thing at the moment for people saying, oh, write a letter to your 16-year-old self, or okay. what would you say to your 21-year-old self? Um, and we did a piece earlier in the week, uh, which was really popular, where um, Viv Groskop said, actually, you can get some really interesting advice from younger women who still mm. have that energy. <laughs> yeah. still haven't had the edges knocked off them, if you like. Yeah. Um, and that, that's not to say we all have, but you know what I mean. <laughs> We're all, like, um, sanded down. <laughs> and actually, so I suppose, um, and I was reading your essay this morning and thinking about kind of what you'd learned on that journey. So mm. I, I suppose uh, my question is, if you were to write a letter, a letter to your... 50 year old self or wow. 45 for the sake of argument okay what would it or give some advice to your future self what would it be you mean how she she should live that as as her 45 year old self or to not have regretted anything or whatever you think oh goodness well i would say you know i like wear marjorie crick's trousers obviously. <laughs> yeah. yeah wear good tailoring yeah. <laughs> um i would say you know be kind to yourself. I mean, that's what I always say, you know, whatever age, really. Be kind to yourself. Stay curious. Stay humble. Like, I think that's, from a sort of point of humility and curiosity, I think so much can grow. So much knowledge and so much adventure. Say yes to everything, even if you're 50. Yeah. 50 is young, I mean, yeah, Even if you're 80. Even if you're 80, say yes. Um, so, yeah, say yes to things. Be kind. Good tailoring. Um, stay out of the sun. <laughs> yes. It'll yeah. be too late by then. Floss. Floss. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm terrible. I'm always sunbathing. I never floss. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, well, I've started flossing, actually. My American <laughs> agent was like, oh my God, you don't floss? It's like, oh, okay, yeah, so I started. It's such a thing, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and lastly, uh, what's next? Um, well, I've got a few kind of nebulous ideas in my mind, um, but I want to sort of marinate them for a bit because it has felt very uh, intense, kind of like a concertina three or four years of, of creativity, and I'd just quite like to recharge a little. So by the end of October, I'll have done quite a lot of publicity and, and festivals and literary events for the Muse. And, and then we'll see. Hopefully there'll be some announcements, but I, I, I'm sort of taking it easy. Great, brilliant. Thank you, Jessie. Thank you. Thank you so much.